Hey guys, and welcome back to another podcast. This is Solo 16. Uh, it's me again, as usual, on my own. I was going to get George on today, but he's just got quite a busy day for us to sort of hit it at the time that we both wanted to hit it. It wasn't going to happen, but I will get George back on soon because things, things are getting very exciting in, in his prep. So we're going to have some exciting topics to talk about. But as usual, Guys, thank you so much for the fantastic array of questions that I've got through Instagram. It always surprises me, especially when I post it of an evening. The amount of questions that come flooding in is is pretty damn cool. So I'm I'm really grateful for that, and uh, let's crack into things. So a bit of an update on myself, as always. Last week, when the last time I spoke to you guys, I was just starting my four day deload. So four days off the gym, came in nice and fresh on Monday, and I started off with with Paul, and that was a really good session. And I've had since then push and legs. So I've just started a new split, which is basically going back to one of my favorite ever splits. Uh, Rationale behind this is that I was basically getting a little stuck with my secondary rotations on the push-pull-leg split. And I was finding that I was having to potentially see a higher frequency of, of exercise rotation than I like. And I would, I therefore changed my split to basically give myself a little bit more recovery after the the second phase of the the microcycle. So a second phase of the of the split. Now I could have done this on a push pull leg split. I could have just done push pull legs, then off, then push pull off legs off. I could have done that. Could have absolutely done that and made it sort of like a a longer microcycle of training, but. I know that this split was split works very very well for me in terms of recovery and fitting in all the lifts that I want to have currently in a rotation. So the split runs push, um, sorry, the split runs pull, push, legs off, upper, lower, off, and this has just always worked so well in terms of my overall capacity to recover. Um, if anything, in 2016, I was running a six days on split. Uh, obviously, I was much weaker than I am now, and my propensity to be able to train hard was lower. So I was able to run that split and get away with it. Now, I don't think I'd be able to do that at all. Like I've come around to the, the third the third training day yesterday legs, and it went very well, but I'm definitely needing the rest day that I have today. So that's just an update on my split. So that's changed. Um, other than that, nothing else has really changed. Just feeling good off the back of the deload, feeling fresh. Uh, I had a, f- a couple of really good sessions here at Ultraflex in Sheffield. Um, hence why also apologies for the, the slight shift in audio quality. I'm not recording on my usual microphone here. So sorry if it's a bit quieter or louder or just not as good quality. That'll be back to normal next week. And I've got obviously, you know, upper lower to finish off for the rest of the week. My hip is feeling all good. So the four days off did that some absolute world of good. And other than that, I'm getting the only other thing that I'm just sort of managing at the moment, which is a bit of a pain in the ass, is just the when from that incident where I dropped a deadlift bar on my leg on my quad. Um, obviously, the initial bruising was there. That's all fine. You know, there's no pain. There's no irritation. There's no nothing. However, where the bar actually hit my leg, there's a, a, a fairly decent amount of, of scar tissue. Um, it's very similar to that of the scar tissue you'd have if you had like an operation or something like that and your leg was trying to heal from the impact or the well you're basically the disruption so you disrupt an area in your body especially where there's lots of muscles tendons ligaments and there's going to be scar tissue so there's scar tissue there which is to be honest be very honest with you here it's getting to me a little bit because i'm like is this going to affect the cosmetic appearance of my leg and you know, I don't don't think it has yet, and I don't think it will, um, because it's come down significantly already in like a two month period, um, and I've got physios working on it to get it down even further um, with things like you know massage, grafting therapy, acupuncture, etc. Um, I'm just doing everything I can to basically get rid of it because I can't have that. Basically, I can't have any sort of issue or cosmetic change to my lower body. Um, so I'm fixing that. And this is something that I said in my Instagram post: like, if you've got an issue, fix it. You know, there's so many ways you can work around issues and try and fix them. So I'm just finding ways that I can fix things, and this is one of the things that I need to fix. So I'm fixing it. <laughs> um, but besides that, all is well, all is good. I hope all of you guys are good and well as well. And let's crack in to the questions. Um, so, uh, one of the first questions was, uh, when I have a client that checks in and has binged or eaten off diet, is there anything I would change? So, 
I'm lucky in the sense that a lot of my clients are very adherent, and I think this is partly down to the way that I coach and how they know that they can be very honest with me. So they know that if they can be honest, they don't want to come in and check in and say that they've overeaten. You know, they want to be adherent. And a lot of people that sign up with me have, they, they sign up with me because they see a lot of what they believe in and what they sort of like stand for in me, you know, and, and, and they come to me as almost thinking like I'm someone that's pretty stern, pretty straight up, pretty, you know, strict, pretty consistent. And most of my clients are that kind of person. They're pretty strict, they're pretty consistent, and they get their head down and they do their job. So the amount of client check-ins that come in and say that they've binged, I can count on one hand. Now, obviously, as you diet down, the frequency of these things potentially happening mm. is rising. This becomes this becomes a more of a, a more of a, a, a physiological issue than a psychological issue. Um, obviously, as hunger hormones get like skewed when you start to diet, leptin and ghrelin start to make you extremely hungry, and your ability to gain satiety, so your ability to gain full, just continues to drop off. Meals just feel like they're going straight in and digesting and not creating any form of satiety, and that's where it is like you know a case of understanding that you want the result more than you want the extra food. You know, cr crave, crave winning the show. Don't don't crave extra food or binging or eating a giant tub of ice cream or something because that's not taking you towards the goal whatsoever. You know, like your 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 want and your desire and your passion should be for you know not not for food, not for the post show food. It should be for winning the show, for winning the trophy. And that's what I say to my clients. You know, focus on what you want out of this, and uh, then the psychological thing that they're locked in and they just go to work. Now. In the rare occasion that someone has overeaten, um, and it's a contest prep, I will be pulling food from their diet, um, most likely. It depends on the severity of the, the binge and overeating, but let's say someone went, like, let's say, for example, they're two weeks out, and they overate, they binged, and they overate by a thousand calories. I'd use the rest of that week to pull from most of the days to make the pulls m less significant. So I'd split the the thousand calories that they'd overeaten. I'd split that from pulling from all of their seven days within the week, and then that should hopefully bring them back to a at least a, a body weight baseline before they then go back into their normal diet. So that's what I would tend to do because I'm I'm not wanting to lose any progress at that standpoint. Uh, if someone's binge eating and and uh, obviously having a having a, a frequent issue, and it's in their off season and it's more of an eating disorder kind of thing, I use as many tactics that I could use to determine why it's happening because I think the understanding of why or what the triggers are, you know. So for example, some some of my clients have had you know minor eating disorders where they have overeaten on a reg a fairly regular basis, um, and it's almost always like 80% of the time a emotional attachment to food so when something goes wrong in their day when you know they, they get a bit upset their reliance is food and at that point I just try and remove food as an emotional tool use something else as an emotional tool so whether it's going for a walk listening to a podcast you know even like just getting a bit upset and you know just writing it down and just or even talking to me um and that tool as something else that's not food is a win and the amount of times i've had clients message me saying you know i've had a win today because i was going to binge and i used the tools that we talked about and i didn't and that's a that's a huge win you know and you know whilst i'm not in a position to coach people with severe eating disorders that is basically affecting their health massively. I've talked about this hundreds of times. Um, you know, you see, need to seek uh, healthcare professionals in that in that instance. But I can definitely have an imp 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 an impact on their ability to use their mindset to work around what they're dealing with as much as possible. And that's something that I have done fairly frequently. So that's that on on binging. So I also had a question which I'm going to very quickly cover. I'm not going to put it in the timestamps because you can just refer to the other podcast. So basically, Rock Hard Fitness asks about how to optimize sleep when you have erratic shifts. 
So Luke covered that fantastically in the episode with Luke. So I'm just going to leave that. Go and watch the Luke Luke Hoffman podcast. He covered that. All, go to the night shift timestamp. And basically what he says there will work well for erratic shifts. Um, but one thing that I will say, actually, so I will kind of answer this question, I guess, um, is that when you have erratic shifts, you know, Luke covered the night shift part. So when you have erratic shifts, what you need to do is you need to get into as much as a, of a routine as you possibly can. And unfortunately, regulating your circadian rhythm on erratic shifts is pretty damn impossible. You know, because you, you one day you you know you're having to wake up at five a.m. The next day you don't start work until two p.m. and it's just all over the place. So to be honest, if you want to optimize your sleep, uh, this is an honest answer. Don't do erratic shifts. <laughs> like don't do them. Find another job. I, I know that sounds crazy, but it's the reality of things. You're not going to have efficient sleep. Wake waking up and then going to bed at completely different times all the time. Um, now, if you can at any point regulate your, your bed and your wake time, so let's say your earliest shift you have to get up is 5 a.m., okay? So your goal then is to get up at 5 a.m. every single day and just make your bedtime early. But then let's say you work one night and you're like, you finish at 11.30 at night and you're not in bed by 12, 12 midnight. That's not going to work, is it? Like five hours of sleep. I'd rather you get, you know, a quality night of sleep in terms of length and then wake up later. So that's that's essentially what you got to do. Do your best. Do your best. Um, it's, but it's an unfortunate position to be in, just like night shifts. You know, Luke at the end of his night shift talk was like, you know, ideally just don't work night shifts. That's the reality of things. Just don't do them, ideally. Um, Rory asks how to overcome back pain from heavy lifting. Now, if you're getting back pain, that's sort of like one of the signs of that execution could be improved. So your overall form could be uh, could be could be better, could be more efficient, could be more safe. And a lot of the time, people don't realise this. And the reason why they don't realise that their form is not great is because they don't film themselves. Um, now, filming yourself in the gym, whilst it might be a bit annoying, whilst you might think, "Oh, okay, I don't want to film myself in the gym. It's a waste of time." I see these people like I, I I get looks. I get weird looks when I go around with any bit of filming equipment in the gym, or ask someone to record something and. You know, the thing is, I know I need to record my sets because if I don't record my sets now and again, I know that I could quite get quite carried away with a load on the bar and forget that I have to execute. And a lot of the time I want to see how a lift looks to know whether I can move forwards on loading or not. And, you know, this is where an external feedback tool like filming is massively important because you can only weigh upon your internal feel for so long. Your internal feel might start to change. Um, you might start to get different connections, and things might things might just shift, and you might not realize it. The internal feel might still be fairly good, but things might shift out of line. You know, you might have some thoracic rounding, which is leading to pain in your upper back. You might have some some lumbar rounding in a pull, which is leading to lower back pain. You might have, you know, you might generally just have like tight glutes, and you know the tightness in your glutes is reducing their capacity to to both work correctly and then it's also increasing their capacity to pull on your lower back and your lumbar and introducing back pain you know some some people don't even lift weights and have back pain because they're sitting down all day and their glutes are completely inactive and then when they're tight and inactive they're just pulling on your lumbar spine um, or pulling on your lumbar tissue sorry your erectors and that's going to cause pain and that's going to cause tightness so my biggest tip for back pain is going to be stretching your glutes, stretching your hamstrings frequently, uh, moving frequently and making sure that you're active, um, you know, in between sessions, try and like, look at me, like I'm standing, I'm always standing. I'm never, I'm really, really, really don't like sitting. Um, sitting for me locks me up, makes my tip hit, <laughs> makes my hips tight. Um, almost said tits, they're strong. <laughs> Uh, it makes my hips tight, makes my lower back tight, um, like QL feels off, like ev everything just hurts. Um, and I, 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 the worst recovery capacity I ever had was when I worked an office job, you know, like, so yeah, just, just try and move, get moving, stand up, um, and make sure you're filming yourself. Um, so that's my tips there, Rory. I, I hope some of those help and ultimately, you know, <sighs> 
when you're lifting pretty heavy loading in the gym, you're going to get some, at some point, back pain. I think people um, avoid, like, feeling, like, avoid understanding what their back pain is about and whether it's bad or like everyone just thinks oh my god back pain back pain back pain back pain must be so bad it must be so bad a lot of the time it's not bad um you know a lot of the time it's something that you can fix to a degree if it's if it's something that's interrupting your day getting in the way of daily tasks you need to get that fixed so, and, and, and and admitting that is the first first stage of fixing something i i, I genuinely think there is 80% of lifters out there that don't want to admit that they've got a niggle or an injury or they're hurt. They don't want to admit it because they think they're th Superman or Superwoman or whatever. And then one day, I guarantee this is going to come round and it's going to bite you in the ass. The reason why it's going to bite you on the ass is because you're just going to be at a point where you're not going to be able to lift anymore. Um, and and that's just that's just not where you want to be. Danny, say hi. Hey. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, next question. Cool. So, um, Rory also asks about getting clients to adhere to their programs. So, again, very similar to the answer that I had earlier in the podcast. Um, I had the uh, question of like binging and overeating. So, adherence to programs is usually for me very easy. I don't have many clients that don't adhere. Um, the reason why is again, I, I just make it an absolute priority that they're going to be adhering. Um, and at that point, they understand that I've set the, I've basically set the mark and they need to just hit. And a lot of the time, if, if someone's not adhering, I will work as hard as I can psychologically to tap into their mindset and think, okay, how can I get this person to adhere? And a lot of the time it works. A lot of the time it works really does. But half of the time, it like half, some sorry sorry a very small frequency of the time, it doesn't. And when it doesn't, I literally say to this person, "Look, I have tried everything in the book to try and get you to adhere. You're not adhering. You're I'm not the right person for you." And Jordan said this in one of his in podcast with um, Mark Holtz. He said, like, you know, if someone's not willing to, to work and put in the work needed, I'm not the right coach. And and I, I, I'm at a point now where my client numbers are high enough for me to say, look, like, I'm not I'm not the right guy for you. And, you know, you're you're essentially wasting your money every single month on me because I am giving everything that I've got and you're not giving it your end. And a lot some some people out there just won't adhere. Just just like for some reason something in their head just won't click and they just won't adhere. And those are the people you don't want, unfortunately. Those are the people that you won't get results with and they may just be like basically just ride it trying to like ride off you or like I don't know, maybe they just want to coach because they feel like, you know, they feel like they just they just want to coach. They don't really want to adhere. They just want to coach. And that's not what I'm here for. I'm here for results. I'm here for changing people. And and that's going to come from adherence. Um, now, getting them to adhere. So the actual question, the answer to the question is, you need to make sure that they're very clear on what they want to achieve. Adherence does not exist without a given goal. Because why would you want to do something that's inherently hard or difficult when you don't know why you're doing it? Like, why the fuck would you get up early in the morning, go on the Stairmaster at level 10, bust your balls for no specific goal? Why would you do that? Why would you go in the gym, make yourself sore, create soreness, lift weights for no specific goal? Like, you know, of course, you don't have to compete. You don't have to lose fat and you don't necessarily have to have a muscle mass goal. But why are you doing it is an understanding of why you're doing it. Now, the reason why you don't have to have any of those inherent, like normal target goals, which most of my clients have, some people might just fucking love it and enjoy it. And that's sometimes what I instill and remind people of, some of my clients, I remind them, look, you do this because you love it. That's why you're doing this. So keep doing it. Like, this is that you love tracking your food. You love going to the gym and, and training. Like you, you, you do, and I know they do because the amount of, of passion that they display when they have a good week. I know they love what they do. So for me, it's a reminder of you no, know, it's a reminder of the uh, the passion and the lust for wanting to improve and be better and do what they love. And that's what I try and instill in my clients. 
but always, 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 always get them to set goals, get them to have them visual, whether it's on a whiteboard, whether it's writing them on their tracking document, whether it's having a separate page on their tracking documents to say, this is your goals. These are your, these are your set goals for the year. This is what we're trying to improve. This is what we're chasing down. Make them time specific. So, you know, in five weeks, you want to be 10 pounds down or, or you want to be, you know, four pounds up and stronger like set these goals and chase them down absolutely relentlessly. And that's one of my things I constantly remind myself of. I'm like, okay, if I feel a bit down or a bit upset in my progress, what is the goal here? And is mopsing around, getting upset about where I am at going to help? Absolutely not. If anything, it's going to make things a lot worse. So yeah, that's my perspective on adherence, mate. I hope that helps. Cool. So next question is time of the day you supplement with zinc and magnesium citrate so first things first i don't supplement with magnesium citrate um the reason being is it's a fairly harsh strain of magnesium and it can cause gastric distress in the sense that you may have pretty significant trips to the toilet um magnesium citrate in larger quantities um uh, and in some people uh well, in most people in large quantities, uh, may be used to basically clear clear um, as much <laughs> as much bowel movement as possible. Um, you know, it's actually something that people use when, like, for example, they're trying to make weight um, and they want to just drop off as much as possible. So I wouldn't recommend a citrate. Um, I mean, it's it's possible that you can use a citrate and get away with it fine because you're going to take a dose that's that's low enough to not cause any side effects. But take a dose, especially when you're maybe lean and your body's more susceptible to little changes and little differences in your diet or supplementation and minerals. And you take a citrate and let's say you're two weeks out and you shit yourself and you're just like losing water weight and losing like losing fluid and you'll be all over the place. You'll be, um, yeah, you'll be in the gutters. So don't, I wouldn't use a citrate. Um, I'd use a glycinate. And I'd use a zinc piconate. I'd get them both from Nutri Advanced. Um, it's, a, it's a company that I, I trust mm. for basic core supplements. Um, of course, you know, I, I work very closely and I'm sponsored by A List. You'll know that. I have no affiliation to Nutri Advanced whatsoever. Just some of the products that A List don't do. Um, you know, the, the baseline products like, you know, magnesium glycinate, zinc piconates, etc. I do I do end up mostly getting from Nutri Advanced. Um, because you can just basically it's, there's no difference in the panel. There's no <laughs> there's no difference in, you know, the the actual like the actual ingredients, like it's a magnesium glycinate, it's a zinc piconate. That's what it is. But you can guarantee the quality is gonna be very high from those. Um so that's where I get it from. I still haven't answered your question. <laughs> I go off in a million tangents, as you can see. So, uh, magnesium and zinc, both about 30 minutes pre-bed. Ideally, on as much of a fasted stomach as you can create. So, let's say you have your pre-bed meal two hours before bed. An hour and a half later, you'd be having your, your magnesium glycinate at 200 milligrams, most likely. And your zinc piconate... Um, I've forgotten the actual dose on the Nutri Advanced Zinc Piconate, so I'm not going to say it because I'd just be just be second guessing myself because I haven't actually taken Zinc Piconate in a while because um, I was taking it when I was dieting. Uh, now I just don't don't really see the need. I'm sleeping like an absolute baby at the moment. You know, I'm getting like 95% sleep efficiency, eight hours of straight sleep with no waking up every single night, and I, I must admit. I'm taking at the moment pretty much nothing for sleep. Um, I take magnesium glycinate and that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, and I've obviously I've got Dr. Dean's sleep stack. I've tried that out a little bit. I think that would be something great for me when I'm dieting down and I really need something to, 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 to make sure my sleep is efficient as possible. But when my sleep's how good it is now and I'm not using nothing... I'm just like, let's just keep doing this. And obviously I use my blue light blockers and I have a really good sleep routine. I go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, etc. So I think that just shows how important just a baseline level of routine is. And then go from there. Now, when else would you take magnesium glycinate and zinc piconate? Zinc, nowhere outside of the bed window. Um, now, magnesium plays a role in the ANS. So the, or the Auto, uh, the regulation of the ANS. So ANS being the autonomic nervous system, and that's our 
uh, balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic states. Now, magnesium glycinate is a calming mineral. And if we use this at time periods that we want to flip the switch between a, a sympathetic state and a parasympathetic state, so we want to get from a, a heavily sympathetic driven state to a more par parasympathetic or relaxed state, um, so a heightened stress state to a relaxed state, we could possibly use magnesium, uh, magnesium glycinate amongst other uh, ingredients, for example, uh, L-theanine and maybe even ashwagandha as an adaptogen to calm the nervous system and prepare ourselves for what is going to be our recovery. And this is the, the, the pivotal role that the ANS plays in uh, adaptations to increasing muscle mass and also making sure that you're constantly in a relaxed state for dropping body fat. Okay, because we know that being in a heightened sympathetic or a, a, a high sympathetic dominant environment when we're in fat loss is not optimal either. So that flicking of the switch, magnesium glycinate, post-workout, why not? 200 milligrams, it's not going to make you go to sleep, it's going to calm the nervous system um, and it's going to, like my clients take magnesium glycinate if they're taking it post-workout and pre-bed. Um, now, when I was prepping, funnily enough, um, I must admit I took it three times a day. So I took magnesium glycinate, 200 milligrams post, post cardio in the morning to, to again try and calm my nervous system a little bit. Then I took it post workout and I took it pre bed. Um, that was obviously 246, so 600 milligrams across the course of the day. Um, obviously, now I don't have the requirement for that, but I still take it post workout and pre bed. So I hope that answers your question, dude. And yeah. That's, that's basically it. So during a cut, how much fat in the pre-workout meal would you suggest my meal is whey and dark chocolate? So I would say that about 10 grams of fat from a direct source is going to be enough when you're contest prepping and wanting to include fat in the pre-workout meal. Um, the reason being is the reason why we want to have fat in the pre-workout meal is to prevent reactive hypoglycemia. So that's essentially the, the blood sugars dropping. And that's getting to the point where we're going hypo and you have to be fairly lean for you to go hypo. So I think a lot of people say, oh, I'm going hypo uh, and they're really not. Um, they're just feeling a little tired. Um, when you go truly hypo, you get like weird sweats. So not necessarily hot sweats, but more so cold sweats. And then you start feeling like you're can't, you can't do anything. So funny stories like, I always used to finish my intro about three quarters of the way through the session when prepping. And by the time that I'd finished that intro, which wasn't very big, and the time that it took me to get home, I was going hypo about halfway home. And I remember just driving around roundabouts, just like in a complete daze, just like not knowing what, what even what even was the exit to get off. And then on the days where I had to stop off, stop off at the supermarket to grab food on the way back from, from the gym, I would literally just walk around the supermarket, just not having a fucking idea where I was going. No clue whatsoever. Just just walking aimlessly around the supermarket. Now, going super duper hypo for any long period of time is actually very dangerous. Um, like from a, I don't, I know I don't think from a, a natural perspective. So hyperglycemia that's created in a natural setting, so without the presence of exogenous insulin, obviously. Uh, as naturals can't use exogenous insulin, but um, you know, assisted bodybuilders can, and the the reactive hypoglycemia that you can create with that, I think, actually can kill you. Um, but I'm pretty sure that the human body in a natural setting without exogenous insulin can't can't have that happen. But don't quote me on that. Um, I'm pretty sure that it's not it's nothing it's nothing that could kill you type of hyper hypoglycemia, but it's something that makes you feel pretty shitty. So. Uh, again, like I said, 10 grams of fat would probably be adequate. Dark chocolate, that would be about 20 grams. To two squares of, of, of a 90% dark chocolate would be about 10 grams of fat, 11 grams of fat. And that would be appropriate in that window. Um, and again, obviously fats delay the digestion. So if you're having oats as well, slower digesting carb, um, and you're having a bit of fat with that, you'll probably be fueled up for your entire session and feel good. So that's my thoughts on, on that question. Um, my my thoughts on the, the, the dog crap method. So I must admit that I've not done a crazy amount of reading on dog crap training. Um, 
obviously um some of the dc style stretches i do in my training routines currently and i've done quite a lot of of research into them and actually some of the some research is, is actually just coming out on um like isometric holds or increased stretches during training that can actually increase um hyperplasia and therefore increase lean tissue potentially um there was one that was study that was released like i think yesterday or the day before or was pub published at some point recently uh it was on the pt collective i think that that they did a lot of infographic there's probably been loads of research to be honest done into it over the years um but yeah i love that principle i think some of the rest pause principles in dog crap is amazing too um uh, I think muscle uh, muscle rounds are more of a, a, a Dr. Scott Stevenson uh, principle, but some of the other rest pause methods in dog crap is great. Um, I think you've got to be really mindful as to where you're at in your training career with regards to using these principles and using a very low volume training program like dog crap um, mm. because you absolutely have to know how hard you can train with a principle like that. Let's say you're 17, 18 years old, mm -hmm. you've just got into training and you're like, I'm going to do dog, dog crap. That's probably a bad plan. Uh, you'll probably learn to train hard very quick if you know how to put it together. But if you can't train hard and you can't elicit the intensity that you need to elicit in your sets, that's not the approach for you. You need to learn how to move and then how to train hard and then you can start using dog crap. So, or, or try it at least. So, yeah. And obviously through following um, people like Dusty Hanshaw and things like that, you know, um, I do definitely see its use um, and see the, enjoy the enjoyment factor of it as well. Um, so, yeah, that's my, my thoughts on dog crap. Um, I don't know a huge amount. Uh, I would like to know more, um, but obviously I've done a lot of reading on like Dr. Scott's stuff. I've ha I have both of his books. Um, I just got the new. It's not a truly a training book, but I just got the new contest prep contest prep contest prep book from uh, Cliff Wilson um, and Peter Fitchin. Uh, I've read a little bit of it so far. I've read most of the Peking stuff. Really good. I highly recommend getting that book. If you want a book to read on bodybuilding, um, that's all about contest prep. That's a pretty good book. Um, so, uh, next question. Uh, opinions on natural bodybuilding feds. So, what are the best? What are the worst? I don't think I'm going to say what's the best and the worst on this podcast because that's unfair. Um, well, actually, fuck it. I'm going to say what's the best and the worst because ultimately it's my opinion. Mm. Um, I'm entitled to it mm. and... And that's fair enough, mm -hmm. to be honest. So, my opinion, mm -hmm. um, the best federations in the UK for natural bodybuilding are the UK DFBA and the BNBF. Absolutely. Hands down. Hands down. Uh, why? They have the best opportunities for the athletes. Um, they have the best standards. Both the BNBF and the UK DFBA finals were incredible. The standard is off the charts. Um, both federations care about the athletes. Um, they do put the athletes first. Um, and they make sure that, you know, the venues are, are great. They make sure that the backstage people are good. They make sure, you know, you're glazed. They, they care, they care, they care, they care. And it's a, you know, it's a nice federation. Now, obviously there's, there's other natural federations. I'm not going to name names, but I think what's happening with some of them mm -hmm. is that they're not keeping up with the mm -hmm. times. And when you don't keep up with the times, something happens and people will get ahead of you. And that to me is, I think, frustrating um, for, for an athlete to watch, you know, an, an athlete that wants to compete in as many federations as possible, do as many shows and, and compete in these federations and to not have some of these federations keeping up with the times and doing what they need to do to grow is frustrating. I also think that... There shouldn't be so much beef for like uh, uh, political stuff in between federations. It just annoys me. Like I love both the top nat natural federations, um, and I think uh, like I, I just I, I I just I just love bodybuilding, and I don't think that it's fair for someone to think, oh, okay, you know, just because of this, just because of that, it means he likes this federation more than that one, like. Nah, not like that. I've got clients competing in both. Um, I think both have their both have their selling points, and both are great federations. Um, I also don't think it's right to, you know, think poorly upon a federation based on the fact that they've introduced more classes. 
you know, essentially that the men's physique and the bikini classes are some of the most popular classes in the UK and to give natural drug free bodybuilders a chance to compete in those categories, um, I think is a good idea, you know, but who, who am I? I'm just a, you know, I'm, I'm just a 22 year old little kid. So, you know, I, I, I'm, but again, I think I'm entitled to my opinion. I've been in this sport since I was like 16. So I just think that it's not fair for, um, people to maybe shun or, or talk badly upon people just because they've introduced more classes, you know? Um, and, uh, that's, that's n like no hate to any other federation. Cause I, I love all of them all the same. You know, I think they're both great. Um, so, but if you want to compete and you want to like do natural bodybuilding, you get EFBA, BMBF, um, then you also got DFAC affiliates. You've got the WMBF affiliates. So you've got the opportunity to compete potentially in really good world finals. So there's a lot of opportunity as a natural athlete within those federations. So that's my opinion there. I hope that makes sense with regards to natural federations. Um, can you change squats for a leg press? So this is a quite an interesting question because like when you're looking at um, what these exercises are going to give you in terms of potential quad de development, um, of course, you, you could do one or the other. And I have a lot of clients that can't really squat, but they're doing other squat patterns because a leg press, a normal 45 degree leg press or pin loaded leg press is not a squat pattern. You know, whilst we're obviously going through knee flexion, um, it's not a squat pattern. It's a leg press pattern. And I think, you know, you could still develop a really good degree of muscle mass with a leg press for sure. I think a pivot leg press would be even better uh, if you're looking to swap a squat for a leg press because you'll be able to replicate the squat movement pattern a bit more uh, comparative to a normal 45 degree leg press. But if you're going to swap a squat, I'd swap it for a squat variation. You know, like a V-squat, a hack squat, something that mimics that movement pattern a little bit better than a leg press. So that's my, my thought process on that. But again, you know, view why you're trying to do this. You know, are you trying to build more muscle by using the leg press because you feel it better? Um, if you feel a leg press better, then review why you're feeling it better. Is there something you can do differently on your back squat to improve your connection? You know, is there is there something you can change to make something better here, make something improved. Um, that's my thought process on squats versus leg presses. But both have their place, you know. I don't don't see an issue with with doing, you know, I don't see an issue with doing more of one or the other. If you feel like, so let's say you feel a better connection on a leg press. One, work on your connections with a squat, work on your patterns with a squat, work on elevating your heel if, if that's going to make a difference um, for you and your, your mechanics. Work on a front squat, work on a safety bar squat, work on a hack squat, work on a V squat, work on every single variation you can until you find something that fits you. And then when it fits you, perfect. You know, you've got a movement that you can then progress and be pain free. So you don't necessarily have to go to the leg press. Obviously, some people's gyms are limited. You'll have to use a leg press. Um, and I think that's obviously ultimately a, a very important thing to realize that we're limited on kit and you know, therefore higher volume or higher amounts of leg pressing could be a an in, a way to to maximally build your quads without getting injured or hurt on a back squat that doesn't fit you. Um, so yeah, that's that's my thought process on that, man. I hope that makes sense. Cool. So next question is on deloads during prep. So do, 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 do. remain in a deficit or calories up to maintenance? Good question. Very good question. So this is something that I feel quite strongly about. If you have time, you should absolutely go to maintenance because what are we trying to achieve with a deload? We're trying to reduce fatigue and what what is going to help reduce fatigue? Calories. Calories is going to be a huge role in reducing fatigue. Now, something that I do in my deload, so when I took four days off, I ran calories that are not so far off my normal training day calories and I was full. Like I was full up because I knew that I had to absolutely do everything I could reco to recover. So I went on some walks, I I did some light movement, and I ate very close to my training day calories. And I was absolutely full as a house by the end of that, brimmed up with glycogen and ready to go. And I think that's a lot of people are scared to do that. Now, during prep, 
this is a prerequisite of time. Now, this is why time is a huge, huge, huge factor in a bodybuilding prep. If you don't have time, you can't do things like this. You can't push your calories to maintenance in a deload. You've got to lose fat. Like, you can't have a deload and, and, you know, expect to be at maintenance. You can't lose a week of fat loss. You know, a week of fat loss, if you haven't got enough time overall, is like, you know, it's like the holy grail. It's like a golden week. You need that week to get leaner. So you absolutely require to still be in a deficit. But if you have the time, you should absolutely go to maintenance. Absolutely go to maintenance. Recover both diet fatigue and training fatigue. And my God, that second week when you come back off the deload is going to be fire. Um, I also recommend deloading with the approach of just reducing one working set off every single of your exercises, doing no intensity methods. So baseline volume, no intensity methods, and reducing your load slightly so you don't hit failure. That's the way I would deload in a contest prep. That's the way I'm going to run deload to my contest prep because I know that for me, days off unless I'm sick don't work um or don't work as well as they should because i will lose movement patterns a little bit fast um i actually no i won't lose movement movement patterns um because i'll just be i'll, I'll be a very sk similar skill if not more of a skilled lifter by that point so it's not so much for movement patterns so i'll correct myself there it's more so for the fact that i think taking four days off when you're in a diet phase can have more of a fat and a bigger implication in terms of holding on to lean tissue than it is going to be when you're in a obviously in an off season in a surplus just my thoughts psychologically i think i'd really struggle taking four days off as well in a diet um so yeah that's that's my thoughts on reloads or deloads during prep luke asked could i explain a back off uh sorry could i explain a top and a back off set so with a top set the whole goal here is maximum loading within a, uh, a lower rep range. Normally, for me, five to nine is my top is my top set, and this will be as accurate as we possibly can be. The accuracy will still obviously be there. This is a maximal effort set. This is a maximal intensity set. We've worked up to this set with several warm ups, which are sub maximal, which are non fatiguing. We get to this top set and we leave fucking everything on the line. Like nothing is left in that set. That is the set, the session dictation of the, the session is dictated by that set. So top set, everything, go, get after it. Back off set, we reduce loading. And for me on some body parts, I'll do multiple back offs. So two, sometimes even three, but most likely two back offs. Um, for my chest and my shoulders, it's two back offs. On my chest and shoulder days, when I do two back offs, they are at a lower intensity. They are with a lower loading and a higher rep range. So normally 12 to 15. Then two two back offs. So on chest and shoulder days, they'll be just as accurate as my top set, but not as intense. You know, they'll still be intense for sure, but they'll be less intense. So less um, central fatigue. So it's less sort of nervous system fatigue that we're going to accumulate from these. So therefore by, you know, by moving away from that exercise, and I've had one top set of maximal intensity, two sets of slightly sub-maximal intensity, I've not blown my socket when it comes to producing overload in the rest of the session, because from a nervous system point of view, I'm still relatively fresh. You know, when you get to like a point in your training and, you know, you, you've done three sets of maximum intensity how it's how do you expect to for the rest of the session to go you know it's probably going to go quite poorly because you've just literally like blitzed yourself in three sets and that's it you know that'll be game over from you from a fatigue perspective after that movement is done so yeah my perspective on that is is for push that's how how i take it for for legs um i have two top two sorry two sets for most of my big exercises, like yesterday was hack and pendulum. It was just one top set, again, maximal intensity, and a back off with a reduced loading by about 10% usually. Again, same intensity. And then I move on. And that's my favorite way of training, to be honest. Um, I just think that when we're looking at, you know, motor unit recruitment and we're looking at like maximal response to an exercise, we've got to take it there. You know, I'm not really a fan of just mindlessly accruing volume i think on some movements it can work so like you know maybe a a, a compound like a back squat you know, taking that 
for a top set and a back off set is pretty hard. You know, I've done that for months and it and it really does end up like from a nervous system point of view, beating the fucking shit out of you. It's the same for a deadlift. Um, and it would be similar for a bench press as well. You know, just like go beating yourself on a top set and a back off approach with that might be more sensible to accrue volume. But, you know, when we're looking at like something like a hack where you're very locked in, you're just ready to go or a pendulum, I think a top set and a back off set just works so well for those movements. And we're looking at, you know, maximal intensity. And that that's really where I think separates athletes you know is their ability to to take it there and and have those sets that are maximum intensity like mm. for me going into a set where i'm not going maximum intensity i really struggle um you know i'm like what do i do here you know like, what do i do like do i do i stop here <laughs> do I, have i got three more in the tank four more in the tank you know when do i stop um that's a difficulty that i have within my own training so i'm sure a lot of people have that same struggle you know, um, like if you can't psychologically lock into the idea of doing like sub maximal work, a top set and a back off set is probably for you. You know, you can just uh, lit literally give it everything. And, and I, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, if you are a volume trainee and then you're like, but, 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 but I'm not, not doing enough volume. And I'm like, you probably still will do enough volume because your main work, like the intensity that you'll provoke on those, those main sets will be will be a big recovery demand that will be a large recovery demand from your big movements now i am i am a big fan of not like putting a lot of weight in your big movements so those two movements for me yesterday you know i did plenty of warm ups then i did the top set and the back off on both the hack squat and the pendulum that's four work sets very good intensities and then i did three work sets on a leg press three work sets on a seated leg curl three work sets on a leg extension uh three work sets on a on a hip thrust um on a hip thrust machine um some calves and like that's a big session man that's a big big session so i don't think you should be worried about volume and you know come if, if you're a volume trainee that's doing like four or five sets of hacks come and do two sets of hacks with me um and, and see see how you feel the next day um i i know that sounds kind of cocky and, and it's not meant to sound cocky because there's a lot of people that can train a lot harder than me absolutely you know to like name a few that are out there i i know that there's like i, I i've trained with people that can train harder than me obviously big big one being jordan um cuba can elicit an intensity that i haven't got yet um Dan Basket, Dan Bastic, and uh, probably Dan Park as well. I haven't trained with Dan Park himself, but I've seen him train. Like those guys can can do something that I'm not yet to be able to tap into. I don't think you know I'm pretty close, but I'm not able to tap into a lot of what they can do yet. And I, once I once I'm able to tap into that, which just takes time, um, then I'm sure that those sets will provoke provoke even more of a recovery demand, uh, and I'll need even more ashwagandha and magnesium <laughs> to start start to try and recover from that so yeah that that's my um explanation of, of back of uh, back off on a top set and um some general application for you as well so you, how you can put it into your training um big question here will i stay natty i think i've covered this multiple times will i stay natty yes i absolutely will um i uh, have i ever been sort of like sort of thinking about it i mean not really i think the only time i really thought about not being natural was when i was like 16 17 and i just saw kai green and i was like okay that's cool like i want to be him and then i soon realized that you know kai green has probably slightly better genetics than myself so, <laughs> so like and then i thought okay that's that's maybe not aim for kai green that's maybe aim for just you know being a, a good bodybuilder in in the natural scene and just do that but the reason why i will stay natty is because i think i can be a good natural bodybuilder i think i can do well um I think i've proved that already by being a decent junior so i think i can do well as a natural do i think i can turn pro as a assisted bodybuilder i don't think so um i must admit i don't think i don't i don't i don't i don't think i can i mean i'm 22 so that's a bit early to say i guess but i don't i don't think i really have the potential to be a good good professional assisted bodybuilder you know and and, and for me i, I want to win i want to do well and um without the goal of you know being able to win and being able to like do do that level of show um like an olympia for example 
I don't think I'd be fully in it, you know, like sacrificing my health, my general well-being for for that. I just don't think it motivates me enough. So that's what my perspective is on on natural, uh, staying natural. So yeah, and obviously my my goal right now is 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 the natural pro card. So that's absolutely what I'm chasing down, and I know that that requires me to be natural, of course. So yeah, I I, I think once I once I get that and I determine how well I can be, how well I can do in the natural uh, professional level, maybe I'd consider it, but I highly doubt it. Um, so that's that. What has helped you keep gaining muscle even though you're a natural? Um, again, like, dude, look at my page, look at my Instagram page, and look at what I do from a training perspective, um, and l- uh, look at look at that and be analytical, um, and think, okay, am I doing what this guy is doing? You know, obviously, I've 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 definitely gained tissue over this off season already. Look at what I do. Like, look at how far I push up my body weight. Look at how I gather intensity and provoke intensity in my work sets in the gym. Look at it. Look at it and think, am I doing that? And if you're not doing that and you're still smaller than you want to be, start doing that. And then I guarantee you, you'll see a difference. Um, Because a lot of people just don't realize that they're not doing enough. Like, they're not working hard enough on their work. (laughs) They're not putting in enough. And I'm not saying that this guy that's asking the question isn't working hard enough but the the fact that you're asking this question have you still gained muscle even though you're unnatural is a my opinion not a great question because in your head that's putting a limitation on gaining muscle as a natural which is wrong you can absolutely gain buckets of tissue as a natural if you work hard and you put your you put your absolute best foot forwards in everything you every single thing that you do you could absolutely gain bucket loads of tissue but the reason why people don't is they have this stupid idea in their head they're only going to gain one pound of muscle a year so by that by putting it in that that in their head they train like an absolute pussy and they eat like an absolute like like tiny little mouse and then they expect to grow and like it's not going to happen man like you're staying lean all the time, lifting submaximally. Good luck, good luck, and you'll just get absolutely rinsed, absolutely rinsed by someone who's working their absolute ass off and eating plenty of food and growing. Um, when you're on stage, like good luck, good luck to you because you are not you're not going to do well. Um, so you absolutely have to look like. I know that, you know, cause does not meet correlation when it comes to, like, just because someone else does something doesn't mean that it's going to work for you. That's absolutely true. So I don't say, you know, copy what I do because it's most likely not going to work directly for you. But I think there is a understanding that when something has worked for a lot of people, i.e. training very hard and eating a lot of food and resting and sleeping and recovering and growing, why are more people not just doing that and why are more people trying to complicate it by doing silly 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 things in my opinion uh, when they're young and they should just be training hard and like learning how to train hard and they're too busy working out how many reps they've got in reserve on a specific set then you know and and we oh, like, look oh my god it's gonna sound horrible but like Look at some of these guys. Look at these guys that are putting these complex strategies together at 18, 19 years old. Are they, uh, how do they look? How do they look? Do they look like they should look? Do they look impressive? I mean, no, they don't. They don't look impressive. Um, Look at the guys that look impressive. Look at the guys that consistently achieve and do well. Um, Take Mm. something from those guys and make sure that you are employing a lot of what those guys do um don't copy but realize what is happening with the good guys just my thoughts <laughs> again like i'm entitled to my thoughts on this podcast because it's my podcast <laughs> but at the same time i have respect and an understanding of why people sometimes do what they do and i don't have anything against that that's cool do your do you do you <laughs> Do you, boo? <laughs> Fuck's sake. I uh, don't know whether Connor will listen to this. <laughs> Do you, boo? Great. Good. Right. So, next question. Okay. Let's 
I'm running out of time in the hour here and I've not got anywhere near through the questions that I wanted. So I'm going to take one that's slightly off topic from a bodybuilding perspective. So if I could see one singer, rapper or band live in a concert, who would it be? Um, think carefully, I might judge you. Right. <laughs> so right now, right now, it would be definitely someone like Meek Mill um, because I just listen to a lot of his tracks when I train um, and I think that would be the most beneficial one for me let me see other things I don't really listen to a lot where I'm like aware of who I'm listening to anymore because actually gigs would be another one as well either gigs Meek Mill uh, Travis Scott there we go there's three that I'd probably listen to um, that I'd want to go and see and actual fact Travis Scott was like in New York like a week before we went last year and I was like damn like we should have gone and seen him that would have been really good so uh yeah Travis Scott Meat Mill gig something like that that would be epic that would be my decision I hope I haven't lost you as a friend Lucy as a result of that answer <laughs> I love you really <laughs> all right cool so how much does training change in a fat loss phase? Uh, really doesn't. I mean, your ability to recover does drop. So when you're looking at recovery capacity, you have to bear in mind that you might have to drop your volume. Um, but besides that, movements um, doesn't really change at all. Uh, if something is... So let's say your mechanics change slightly as a result of losing body fat. Um, well, it's more leverages and more comfort of exercises than mechanics because mechanics really just stay the same. Um, so let's say like a back squat doesn't feel good, in, good anymore. You're not getting enough quad stimulus. You're just getting a lot of lower back and erectors and things like that. Then shifting that and doing like something like a, a hack would be a good change. Um you know, let's say like a, a, a dumbbell press feels off and stability is all over the place. Doing something like a, a machine press would be a good alternative. You don't want to chop and change all of these things, though. You don't want to pussy out on the hard stuff. You know, when you're dieting down, you should be locking in. Doing a lot of these things that are hard. A lot of these things that are, have built on the, uh, the, the muscle mass that you have now, that you have today. Though that that's like very very important, and a lot of people do back out on things that they should still be doing when they're dieting down. So don't back out on the hard stuff, but at the same time, be aware that if a stimulus isn't being optimally created by the movements that you've selected, then you should absolutely look to change things around a little bit um, to make sure that you're keeping as much muscle as possible. So next question, rest time in between sets. How long should we take in between big compounds like deadlifts and squats? So I honestly think the answer to this question is, is very simple in the sense that we should take as much as we need. Now, how much do I take? I take anywhere between three and five minutes on my big, big compounds. So let's say, you know, we've done like a top set on a deadlift. It might take me another five minutes to be ready for my back off. Um, there's a fine line between your rest being too long that you've lost like kind of the patterning of the movement and it becomes a little bit like foreign when you go back to it. There's a fine line between that and then the rest time being too short that you're under recovered going into the second set. This is where preference comes in. This is where understanding how long you need is super key. Some people need longer. Some people need shorter. Um, I definitely need longer and I don't see a huge detriment in resting too long. Now, if I rest too long and I get talking to someone in between my set, it's distracting and I go back into the set and I've kind of lost my mojo, bad decision. So what I do is I tend to keep my headphones on the whole time. So I, after the top set, headphones are still on. I just switch the music back down to like a you know, like a rest rest period music, so not like the total hype of the top set, but a little bit less. Um, this is psychological stuff. So a little bit less of the top set music, a little bit lower volume, a little bit more relaxing. So it might go from like gigs to Meek Mill or something like that. And then it would be back into gigs for the top set and then I'd go. Um, and I usually rest for like one or one or two songs really, um, move around a little bit, especially if I'm squatting a deadlift and I don't really like to sit down, I like to move around a little bit and then I get back in and do it. So again, preference based, but that's my general 
general thoughts on on rest times so there was one other question that i wanted to cover from <laughs> danny's just asked a load of rubbish questions she's asked who's who's your favorite person which is obviously her um right so okay uh let's have a look there was one question from genie which i wanted to answer which was good so yeah genie asks about uk dfba bikini and there's actually so many good questions here, guys. So, as usual, I, I take the approach of asking longer questions than asking, than doing loads and covering like them really short. Because the whole goal with this podcast is to educate as opposed to just being like quick fire. You know, I could easily do quick fire on my story, but the reason why I do it as a podcast is because I want to give you as much as I can possibly give you and make sure that it educates everyone as opposed to just giving a very short and sweet answer. So, I, if you've asked a question, I haven't answered it, please ask it again and get it in nice and early. So I usually just go from the top, uh, sorry, from the bottom down, bottom up. So quickest questions that come in get answered. So do that and you'll probably get your questions answered. So UK DFBA bikini. Good question here, Jeannie. So what do they, what do they tend to go for? So the two winners at the British finals of both the short and the tall were Lexi and Beth. Beth in the short, Lexi in the tall. Very different physiques, which is interesting. So Beth was much smaller and a little bit more conditioned, a little bit harder in the midsection, a little bit crisper in the back shot. She was very lean, very lean. I remember seeing her at Worlds. Beth was shredded. Um, now, Lexi was also shredded, but she definitely had a lot more muscle and shape than Beth had. And that's nothing against Beth, but she was just bigger. And this is when at the world, I think Beth got overlooked a little bit because she was smaller. Um, and Lexi obviously did very well at Worlds, and she was bigger. Now, so I think this year, taking what they took from Worlds, I think they'll go for a slightly bigger um look but not obviously not bigger and out of condition um but bigger and just in the bikini condition which now with the introduction of the fit body classes that means you have four women's divisions you have bikini you have uh figure you have women's fit body and then you have women's bodybuilding bodybuilding being the the the, the, the top echelons of muscularity and condition okay very hard granite very big bodybuilding poses fit body you have very good condition you have not so much shape as a figure category but you have a very hard and dry look to your physique but we're not going so much for shape here we're going for more, obviously we're judging symmetry we're not going so much for shape here we're going for that hard dry look with still shape but not as much shape as figure figure softer than fit body um still very much going for shape very much going for symmetry and balance and proportions then you have bikini obviously lower levels of muscularity lower levels of condition but still you know i think what they go for is that they want that balancing act of of having you know a good degree of muscle like muscularity especially in the delts in the back um the glutes they need to be full. Um, they need to. You need to display yourself with really good stage presence. Something that Beth and Lexi both had was incredible stage presence and confidence within their physiques. Um, they were very, like, they're very good at displaying what they had, which is awesome. And it shows off on stage when you display it with confidence. So all the posing that you're doing is good, Genie. Like that's going to be a great start. Um, and I think that that's really what they're going to be going for. So it's that, like, the, the reason why I laid out the categories is so you understand that bikini is the lowest out of the classes in terms of muscularity. So they're not looking for lots of muscle. They're looking for, you know, muscularity combined with a little, little bit of condition. You know, they're probably looking for glute ham tie-in, but no striations to the quads. Um, they're looking for a tight midsection, but not crazy blocky abs and not crazy obliques. You know, if you come in and you're, and you're peeled in bikini, you won't, you will look out of place. Um, you know, you can't really get super peeled in bikini. Um, you can get pretty shredded as long as you have enough muscle to go with it. But a lot of the time when bikini girls try and get super shredded, they end up just looking very small on stage and flat. And that's not a good look at all. So yeah, just get. I mean, Jack's in charge. She'll do a great job. So um, just, yeah, get 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 down, get 
get to a nice level of conditioning um, you should probably hit that a little bit before your show and then you can work the balance of where the nice sort of line between fullness and condition really lies so yeah guys I think we'll leave that there for another week um, I might be launching some of these soon at some point if people like them um, I've got a good feedback on Instagram for people wanting them so I'll try and get them on a site sometime soon because I'm not I'm not going to be able to order loads and just send them out. Unfortunately, I'm not. As much as I'd like to be a postman, I'm not. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I can't really do that. But, yeah, uh, other than that, I'll look forward to chatting to you guys next week. Um, I am on my way to £190. The goal is to be 190 by my birthday and then most likely I will either maintain 190 for a little bit depending on how it looks and feels. And then I will be doing the first small diet that I've done in about seven months um, just to clean up and go again. Um, and it will really be a case of just getting in and getting out with that one um, and, and make sure that I get it done and, and get, give me some more room to push back up again and then make 190 look even better than it was this time. So that's really where I'm at at the moment. Um, so you can look forward to following that as always. Um, I will be pretty big at 190, I'll be the biggest I've ever been, so I'm looking forward to being there a little bit, but it's, it's getting getting a little bit harder to sort of, you know, just get the food in and generally feeling a little bit like, wow, there's quite a bit of weight on me right now, which is fine, it's part and parcel, and when I look back at this and I watch this, maybe watch this at the end of the episode in 2020, I'll be like, yeah, okay, that, that paid off, that paid off, I'm sure it will. Um, okay guys, so have a fantastic day, have an amazing weekend. Thanks again for listening. Please share me on your stories. Um, share me on your um, on Facebook, whatever. Share me away if, if you enjoyed this one and uh, give this episode a like if you liked it. That's always really beneficial for me. And the more likes I can get, I'm really like shooting for 100 likes on, a, on an episode. That would be amazing. So if you can add to that, that'd be awesome. Leave any comments below if you enjoyed this. And uh, again, guys, we'll, we'll chat soon. All right, guys. Thanks very much. Bye.